The self-care learning and discovery series is back and it's bigger and bolder than ever. This is the premier self-care event of the year, bringing together self-care enthusiasts of all backgrounds and disciplines from around the world. The World Health Organization defines self-care as the ability of individuals, families, and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and to cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. We also know that self-care means different things to different people. What does self-care mean to you? You'll have ample opportunity to reflect on this question during the Discovery Series with more than 20 interactive virtual sessions organized by self-care experts worldwide. The Discovery Series will elevate cutting-edge research, programming, and advocacy insights across a wide variety of self-care topics. And we encourage you to attend as many sessions as possible, especially on topics that may be new to you. The Self-Care Learning and Discovery Series, a core activity of the Self-Care Trailblazer Group, is organized by the White Ribbon Alliance in partnership with co-sponsor organizations and esteemed steering committee members. We also want to thank all our session organizers and presenters who have voluntarily dedicated their time to curate this event with us. We are pleased to share that every session will offer live, simultaneous interpretation in French, Spanish, and English. To access the interpretation, simply navigate to your meeting controls located at the bottom of your screen. Click on the globe icon labeled interpretation and select the language you'd like to hear. Joining from your phone, tap on the ellipses to find the interpretation feature and then select your language. Please note, you can switch languages at any time throughout the presentation. The session is now about to begin. Don't forget whether you're working to influence policies or programs, advance universal health coverage, or improve your own self-care. We hope that you will take the learnings from today's discussion and apply it to your own work. To that end, we invite you to continue the conversation and take action with us by becoming a member of the Self-Care Trailblazer Group. So get curious, jump in, and share your ideas and insights with us. We look forward to advancing self-care together. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Welcome to uh, one of the penultimate sessions of the Self-Care Learning and Discovery Series. My name is Petra Proctor. Uh, I am a senior program manager uh, at Concept Foundation, coming to you from Geneva in Switzerland. Um, at Concept Foundation, self-care is really core to our work as we increase access to a range of, of quality, affordable SRH medicines and technologies. So I'm really delighted to be moderating this exciting panel today. I'm gonna quickly take you through our agenda. Um, on the next slide, I believe. Um, and then we will kick off with a very brief Zoom poll. For those of you who have, have been attending these sessions already, you'll be familiar with this. Um, if not, and if you have any technical questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but it's pretty straightforward to answer the poll. We'll have a second poll halfway through the uh, session as well. So today's session is all about different types of bleeding that women and girls can experience as part of their, their uh, daily reproductive health. Um, so we are going to have four presentations um, on four distinct topics, but all linked by the um, by uh, reproductive health bleeding. Uh, the first will be focusing on management of menstrual bleeding in Bolivia. Secondly, we will have a presentation on menstrual regulation in Guatemala and Peru. Then we will hear about post-abortion bleeding in uh, India. And finally, um, contra contraceptive-induced menstrual bleeding um, and changes in Kenya. So our speakers, our four speakers, or actually five speakers we have today, um, will be presenting um, research and programmatic findings on each of these topics. So we'll move on now to our
quick poll. You should see this coming up on your screen. So according to UNICEF, how many people around the world menstruate each month? Please go ahead and pick your answer out of the four. People. Mm -hmm. We're seeing lots of different answers. Interesting. I'm going to give it another minute or two as people continue to answer. All right, I think we can end the poll. So we had most of our answers were for the third and fourth option. Um, but the answer to the question is 1.8 billion. So 1.8 billion people around the world are menstruating each month. So with that in mind, I'm going to kick off with introducing our first speaker. Uh, her name is Mina Lee. She is with the UNFPA country office in Bolivia. Uh, she's a monitoring and evaluation specialist um, with over five years of hands-on experience in health projects um, in the Dominican Republic, Cambodia, and Bolivia. Over to you, Mina. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Mina Lee and work as UNFPA Bolivia Country Office as monitoring and evaluation specialist. I'm very delighted to present my pilot study on the accessibility of reusable menstrual pad from the perspective of menstrual hygiene management among women in Bolivia. Thank you very much for listening to our present, my present, presentation. Next slide, please. So before starting the presentation, let me align the agenda for today's presentation. I have six content from the background to conclusion. Next slide, please. So before exploring my research findings, let's provide some context in Bolivia. Bolivia is the ethically and culturally diverse country. According to the census in 2012, almost 42% of the total population self-identified as one of the 36 indigenous populations officially recognized. The Bolivian population is also very young, with four out of 10 inhabitants between 10 to 29 years old. Over the last years, income equity has reduced and human development index has increased. However, the country is uh, in lower middle income country Furthermore, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to unusual economic crisis with increasing poverty and a great difference, differences among the almost left behind populations, such as indigenous, rural women, young people, and adolescents. The country is top 10 most vulnerable countries to climate change globally, characterized by rapid floods and wildfire which especially impact indigenous women and adolescents. Next slide, please. Menstruation hygiene management is a crucial aspect of women health worldwide, and Bolivia is no exception. Reusable menstrual pads have emerged as a sustainable and cost-effective alternative to disposable pad in recent years around the world. However, their adoption among girls and women in Bolivia is still limited and insufficient access to education and resources, resources on menstrual hygiene management. And Bolivians, girls and women still resort to using non-hygienic methods, such as old clothes, to manage their menstrual flow. In schools, has inappropriate bathroom for menstrual and hygiene management. As you can see this picture that uh, I was able to sort out this picture from the uh, Bolivian schools in rural area. There, are, there was not a good condition toilet for menstrual and hygiene management in schools. And this lack of the proper sanitation infrastructure 
can make it difficult for girls and women to manage their menstrual hygiene and dignity. This compounded by inadequate waste to disposal facilities for used menstrual products, and it could lead to environmental concerns. Unlike, unlike other countries, Bolivia has not made progress in ensuring free access to sanitary product and 30% value added tax is applied. This means that some of the girls and women could hesitate to buy their menstrual product. Next slide, please. And evidence on reusable menstrual pad is very limited, especially in Bolivian context. My research aim is specific objective for examining Bolivia females and girls acceptabilities of a reusable menstrual pad and how they can improve their menstrual hygiene management. And with key objective, this research enabled to cover a range of important aspects related to menstrual hygiene management and reusable sanitary pad. The objective were to quantitatively measure their menstrual knowledge, to examine their current menstrual hygiene product use and management practice to explore their attitudes and perceptions toward menstruation. And last, to investigate the local response between girls and women and acceptability of using reusable sanitary pad. Next slide, please. To achieve this objective, we utilize the following methodology, quantitative method using structure questionnaire two times. First of all, or we were able to collect the information on participant menstrual experience, knowledge and product use, and then we distributed distributed regional sanitary pad, and we indicate we educated how to utilize this pad, and we also educated the menstrual and hygiene management for women and girls in Bolivia, and and then we conducted a second survey using Google survey to assess the satisfaction after two months of use. We use convenience sampling to recruit 69 Bolivian women and girls of reproductive age from 11 to 43 from three health centers that we are already being intervened for another ongoing sexual reproductive health project in La Paz. Next slide, please. Yeah, this pilot study was made possibly through the generous donation of Hanna Pet, a top brand of reusable menstrual pet in Korea. This brand is renowned for its certificate organic cotton pet, known for their observancy and comfort. It's important to note that these pets are not yet available in Bolivia or other parts of Latin America. As you can see this uh, uh, this map. Next slide, please. So these were a menstrual and hygiene management kit that we provide. This kit contained a small, medium, and overnight size of a Hanna pet, along with the laundry soap, a pouch, and an instructional leaflet. So they knew and they understand. They understood how to wash and take care of those pet, those reusable sanitary pads, uh, as 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 they can see the instructional leaflet. Next slide, please. So now let's move on the most exciting part, the key findings. The result of our research are as follows. The first. Key finding relate to the current menstrual hygiene product, you see, and management practice was that 90-90% of participants use this brochure sanitary product. The majority of respondents choose menstrual product based on their affordability, which is a cheap price being a main criterion. A significant 59.4% of respondents reported that 
uh, not managing the menstrual pain very effectively. And also noteworthy, 74% of them have experienced hesitancy when buying menstrual product. Next slide, please. According to the knowledge of reusable menstrual pad, more half of them did not know or did not hear about those pads. And 68.4% of them said it would be difficult to find those pads in the stores. And more 50% of them thought that washing and managing those pads would be very difficult. Next slide, please. So after two months of using reusable menstrual pad, uh, we were also able to conduct the, the another uh, satisfaction questionnaire between our participant. So we found that reusable menstrual pad were generally acceptable and beneficial alternative to disposal pad. Uh, over 80% of participants reported satisfaction with non-blood linkage, reduced expenses, and comfort. Some users experience improved overall health and reduce menstrual pain while using those reusable sanitary pads. And 76% uh, of them express a desire to continue using this reusable menstrual pad. And significantly, 90% of them would recommend those pets to their friends or a person one knows. Next slide, please. However, there are still challenges associated with both reusable and menstrual pet and menstrual hygiene management in Bolivia. Uh, Participants faced difficulties related to the washing, reusable menstrual pad, and also they indicated time consuming is, is also one of the aspects as challenging for using those pads. And many participants did not understand the meaning of the menarche and leading to misconceptions, such as the belief the menstrual bleeding caused body weakness. As you can see this table uh, in the aspect of menstrual knowledge, more than uh, approximately 80% of them, they indicated that bleeding, bleeding caused by weakness was uh, incorrect belief. And there were also misconceptions that menstrual does not lead to pregnancy and bathing during menstrual was misunderstood. And also regarding the menstrual attitude, uh, respondents expressed a negative attitude toward menarche, and they have a negative attitude when they started to, to menstruation. As you can see, the over 78%, they had a negative attitude toward menarche. And also they used to use indirect, indirect word to describe the menstruation. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the research shed light on the challenges and opportunities surrounding menstrual hygiene management in Bolivia. The research emphasized the promising potential of reusable menstrual pad in Bolivia, highlighting their acceptability, cost effectiveness, and positive impact on women's well-being. The fully realized these benefits and overcome exciting challenges, efforts show, should focus on improving accessibility, addressing washing concerns, and providing accurate and accessible, accessible menstrual health education. These steps can contribute to more comfortable and healthier experience for women during their menstrual cycle in Bolivia. And also, it is, it is it's very important that it, it had to, we will, we could possibly conduct a further quantitative and qualitative research to identify the involving needs and preference and access to menstruation knowledge and perception. And also I'd like to, to provide some of the recommendations. Affordable access is important. Effort 
should be made to lower the prices of a menstrual product, including reusable menstrual pad, to make them more affordable for girls and women in Bolivia. And comprehensive menstrual health education is also very important. Implementing comprehensive menstrual health education programs in schools, starting at early age, to provide accurate information about menstruation, hygiene, and the use of the menstrual product. The, this education should also address common misconceptions and taboos. In the, in, in the finding that we can see that uh, the, the generally women and girls had a negative attitude when they has had a menarche. So it is more important to, to provide ed health education, especially menstruation at all ages. And next slide, please. So now you may leave any questions you may have. So I think that it is better to leave the any question in our chat so that in the Q&A section, we can discuss more about uh, your questions. So thank you for your attention and insightful questions. If you have any further inquiries or would like to discuss my research in more detail, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mina. Um, thank you for sharing such informative and encouraging results on the potential for reusable pad use in Bolivia and also highlighting, clearly highlighting the forward challenges and opportunities that um, lay in front for scaling up this, this uh, commodity. Um, so moving on to our next presenter, um, Diana Santana. She is um, the Regional Program Director at Planned Parenthood Global, um, the Latin American program. She has 20 years experience in program management and evaluation and applied research with a focus on sexual and reproductive health and safe abortion. She supports the Peru program and is technical lead for regional service delivery, leading efforts to systematize the community-based and client-centered service delivery programs. So I'll hand over now to Diana to take us through her presentation and remind those newcomers, please put any questions you have in the chat box and we will address them in our Q&A session at the end. Over to you, Diana. Thank you, Petra. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, and thank you all for inviting me to share a little bit about the meet and model. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I wanna start off by talking about menstrual regulation and what it is. Menstrual regulation refers to treatments used to regulate a period within a first few days after it being missed or late. And there's a long history, there's a long documented history of people turning to teas, herbs, and seeds to bring down their period, periods without ever having a pregnancy confirmation. For instance, in some Mayan cultures, traditional midwives can provide herbs or medicinal plants to bring down a late period and therefore cleanse the uterus. And in the days before the legalization of abortion in the US, a procedure called menstrual extraction was used to bring down a person's menstruation. In both of these examples, an intervention happens before there is confirmation of a pregnancy. These interventions were not considered abortions as such, but rather a confirmation of a non-pregnancy. It's a subtle but significant difference. Next slide, please. But menstrual regulation doesn't just exist in history or within informal spaces. Today, menstrual regulation has been integrated into formal health systems. In Bangladesh, abortion is legal only to save the life of the mother and even those services are limited but menstrual regulation is incorporated within the National Family Planning Program. At Ministry of Health Centers countrywide, menstrual regulation is a legal and free service provided with manual vacuum aspiration until 12 weeks LMP, or with medications until nine weeks LMP. Menstrual regulation in Bangladesh is an alternative to first trimester abortion. And in Cuba, abortion is legal and available for any reason but menstrual regulation is available for fertility control during the first two weeks of a menstrual delay when it is too early for a legal abortion. And in the United States, in the wake of the Supreme Court taking away the constitutional right to abortion, early studies are assessing the feasibility of missed, missed period pills. Missed period pills 
are uterine evacuation medications, such as methoprostone and misoprostol, or misoprostol only, used for treatment or delayed menses without prior pregnancy confirmation. Early results show that missed period pills are acceptable and desirable for clients. Next slide, please. But before I get too far ahead, I want to share, I want to tell you a little bit about Planned Parenthood Global and what we do. Planned Parenthood Global is the international arm of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. For over 50 years, Planned Parenthood Global and its brave on the ground partners have supported people's ability to make informed decisions about their bodies, their lives, and their futures. In Latin America, Planned Parenthood Global has worked with hundreds of organizations innovating to reach their communities. The alchemy of these collaborations has produced several groundbreaking approaches to improve access to rights-based health services, including abortion. Together, we have designed, piloted, and built dynamic models of care that reach individuals where they are and serve clients how they prefer to access services, from brick and mortar clinics to online platforms. These creative approaches are a result of a powerful combination of Planned Parenthood expertise and that of our partners deeply embedded in their communities and who have a deep understanding of local resources and constraints. Regional and in-country based staff provide technical assistance based on the specific needs of each organization or project. We can best describe the support we provide as accompaniment because it is based on a shoulder to shoulder horizontal approach that focuses on aligning all of our systems and procedures behind this concept and practice, co-creating initiatives and work plans together. And among the many innovations coming from these partnerships is 20 years of knowledge generation and evolving practices around the use of misoprostol. Next slide, please. So about a year and a half ago, we surveyed some partner organizations to gauge their level of interest and knowledge on the topic of menstrual regulation. It turns out that the providers at these organizations often receive clients who come in asking for something to bring down my period. Or they heard phrases like, I wouldn't want to take a pregnancy test. Just tell me what we can do. Or give me something to bring down my bleeding. In some cases, the people we spoke with knew of providers in their communities offering herbs or medications to treat menstrual delay. And out of this was born Mireme. Mireme is an acronym for misoprostol para el retraso menstrual or misoprostol for menstrual delay in Spanish. Mireme is a pathway to care that uses misoprostol for a missed period. It is based on principles of self-care and client-centered services. It responds to a demand for treatments that bring back a period without forcing the client to take a pregnancy test or even acknowledge a pregnancy. Mireme is an extension of Planned Parenthood Global's community-based access to misoprostol model, or CBAM. Both Mireme and CBAM follow a similar protocol for misoprostol use, require good information and counseling of the individual, and are supported by trained community health workers. The protocol is based on the recommended World Health Organization regimen, which is 800 micrograms of sublingual misoprostol every four hours until the bleeding stops. It is the same regimen implemented by the health centers in Bangladesh, and it is a similar to the successful protocol used in CBAM. The key difference is that in Mireme, there is no pregnancy test. This ambiguity regarding pregnancy status may be a bit uncomfortable for some, especially in places where home pregnancy tests are widely available and used. But in many of the communities where we work, the requirement to take a pregnancy test imposes a medicalized perspective on the topic of health and fertility and ignores different perspectives on the role of menstruation. In addition, we know that there are several additional reasons to avoid a pregnancy test. It can be the emotional toll, the financial expense, or even the embarrassment of talking to a provider about a possible pregnancy. <clears throat> the Mireme model uses language around menstrual delay and avoids any mention of pregnancy. For example, there's no mention of calculating a gestational age and instead uses language around calculating the weeks since the last period or something similar. In this way, Mireme responds to the needs and desires of the people who seek the service and respects their cultural practices and needs. 
Next slide, please. Excuse me. After initial discussions with these organizations, three diverse sites were selected to pilot this approach. The partner organizations involved in the development of this model have years of experience expanding access to misoprostol at the community level through other Planned Parenthood global models, such as the CBAM model mentioned earlier. These providers were promoters, pharmacy techs, or other community health workers, and had a basic knowledge of misoprostol, the menstrual cycle, and other related sexual and reproductive health topics. They also provide information and counseling in a safe, friendly, and accessible way to their communities. Before moving on to the next slide, I would like to emphasize that throughout the implementation process, there was a constant evaluation of the model as part of a feedback loop, which allows continual service improvement and identification of emerging needs. Next slide, please. So there were three main phases for the initial implementation of the Medimin model, including um, as, so as previously mentioned, the identification of providers who had a previous experience providing rights-based sexual and reproductive health services. Training of these providers included a deeper understanding of rights-based community services, additional considerations on coming across the need for menstrual regulation, as well as specialized counseling and identification and linkages to additional support networks or referral points as needed provision of community-based menstrual regulation services, included, including counseling. And now we're in a third phase, the application of the model and the evaluation of the results. In addition, the providers themselves are being interviewed to assess ongoing comfort and needs with this model. Next slide, please. The implementation, adoption, and expansion of the Medimin model in the region, like all the models that we have been supporting, has been carrying out, carried out hand in hand with the partner organizations. Technical assistance has been provided to reinforce key topics, replicating community workshops on misoprostol, which include information on sexual and reproductive health, rights-based counseling, the protocol for use, and what to expect when using misoprostol. In some cases, CBAM tools were adapted for the medium context. For example, the use of pregnancy wheels to reinforce the calculation of the date of last menstruation. New tools and support instruments have also been created to support the program staff and on the ground providers. And we've developed a program brief in English and Spanish setting out the model. As this, as this is still very much in progress, I will briefly present some very draft results so far. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, um, okay. In five months of implementation, 76 people received medium services by a trained community-based health worker. The majority come from rural areas and are age 20 and above. Um, next slide, please. Everyone in this phase used misoprostol sublingually and took between one and three doses successfully for a menstrual delay between four and 11 weeks LMP. Anyone over 10 weeks LMP was also referred to a trusted healthcare provider for additional screening and services. Next slide, please. Of the 75 initial cases, all saw a return of the menstruation. And although all clients were counseled to return in case of complication, there were no reported cases of complication. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the uptake of self-care seeks to improve the social landscape around decision-making, access to technology, and when needed, creates links to additional services. It also puts individuals themselves at the center of their care. Mireme is an innovation, oh, Medime is an innovation in menstrual regulation. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing the chats. Medime is an innovation in menstrual regulation and an important step for self-care. Medime expands opportunities for people to make informed decisions regarding a delayed menstrual period and whether or not to confirm a pregnancy. 
We're continuing to collect evidence on how effective and acceptable the use of misoprostol is for delayed menstrual periods and in conversations with other researchers to learn more about similar experiences in the US and globally. We'll disseminate information about pilot results and lessons learned in a brief style report and in webinars like this one. We're gonna expand the pilot with additional partner organizations and identify and train additional providers in other areas. And, and as I mentioned, we're conducting qualitative study on provider experiences. And at the forefront of attacks on sexual and reproductive health in the US and worldwide, I wanna invite you to think about how you can incorporate or adapt more user-centered services, including how to put misoprostol in the hands of the people who need it the most. Thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, wow, that was really, really interesting. And I think um, exactly the kind of research we need to really push the needle on menstrual regulation being a, an effective and, and um, more widely accepted fertility regulation can, tool and, and method for, for uh, individuals to take control of their reproductive autonomy. So moving on, we're going to have a quick break um, and have another poll question, which you should see pop up on your screen. So our second question today is, according to the Guttmacher Institute, worldwide, approximately what percentage of unintended pregnancies end in abortion? So we will wait till we see critical mass has participated and then share the outcomes. Right. So we actually have most most people answering 32% when actually the answer is 61%. 61% according to Guttmacher worldwide uh, of unintended pregnancies and in abortion. Thank you everyone for participating. And we'll now move on to our third of our four presentations today. So our, our next speaker is uh, Katie Key from IBIS Reproductive Health. Katie is an associate research scientist at IBIS where she manages quantitative and qualitative projects. She's currently leading work focused on reconceptualizing measurement of abortion outcomes and complications, as well as research evaluating interventions that expand access to abortion accompaniment models in various settings. Recently, Katie also led and supported research, which contributed to the approval of the first oral contraceptive pill to be available over the counter in the United States. I think also known as the Free the Pill movement. So Katie will be presenting today on management of post-abortion bleeding in India. Over to you, Katie. Thank you, Petra. Thank you all. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Key. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an associate research scientist at IBIS Reproductive Health. IBIS is a nonprofit research organization with offices in the United States and South Africa, and we conduct social science research on access to abortion and contraception around the world. Today, I'll be sharing findings from a study that we conducted in partnership with the Family Planning Association of India on medication abortion experiences. 
I'll be focusing our, on our findings related to the relationship between expectations and experiences with bleeding during the medication abortion process. Next slide, please. So during my presentation today, I'll be discussing medication abortion in some cases with clinical supervision, as well as self-managed medication abortion. Self-managed medication abortion is when a person procures pills from chemists, pharmacists or, other, uh, pharmacists, or other informal vendors without a prescription and initiates the abortion without clinical supervision. Some people who self-manage their abortion may receive some information and support throughout the process, but the experience is largely without cl clinical supervision unless someone chooses to seek additional facility-based care. The WHO recently updated their guidance last year to recommend that people can self-manage their medication abortion without direct supervision of a healthcare provider up to 12 weeks gestation. This updated guidance can be credited to the work of safe abortion hotlines, accompaniment groups, and research that has demonstrated that self-managed abortion is safe and effective. Use of medications for abortion has increased around the world over the past several decades, and as out-of-clinic abortions have shifted from unsafe methods to self-managed abortion using pills, post-abortion care cases have shifted away from complications like sepsis, shock, and bodily injury to outcomes more related to prolonged or problematic bleeding and retained products. Thus, our commonly used strategy of using post-abortion care seeking as an indication of a complication and of abortion safety needs to be reframed. Using, um, using post-abortion care seeking might overestimate abortion complications, particularly in settings where most care seeking is not due to a true medical complication, but rather due to concerns about the abortion process. This may be even more relevant in contexts like India, where the majority of the approximately 16 million abortions that occur each year are self-managed medication abortions. Next slide, please. So with this study, we aimed to pilot a self-report questionnaire to capture outcomes from medication abortion and to understand expectations around symptoms and side effects, particularly bleeding and cramping, as well as desires and reasons for care seeking. Next slide, please. To do this, we prospectively recruited clients who were seeking post-abortion care after using medication abortion from three Family Planning Association of India clinics in Gwalior, Kalchini, and Pune to participate in up to three surveys. Data collection occurred between January and June of last year, and we selected these clinics due to the client volume of people seeking post-abortion care at these locations. This was also part of a larger study in which we also recruited clients who had initiated their medication abortion from one of these FPAI clinics, but today I'll just be focusing on the outcomes of those who sought post-abortion care. So the baseline survey, which was administered to clients before they left the clinic after seeking care and after receiving their treatment, measured participants' expectations around bleeding and cramping, information received, experiences with bleeding and cramping, reasons for care seeking, and their medication abortion outcomes. We also surveyed providers who treated these participants via a standardized chart abstraction tool to observe or to capture observed symptoms from the provider's perspective and the medical treatment received. Next slide, please. So now I'll discuss a little bit more about our results specifically related to bleeding. Next slide, please. So from our larger sample, 156 participants reported taking medication abortion pills prior to arriving at the FPAI clinic. Of these participants, a majority reported self-managing their abortion and procured the pills from a pharmacist or chemist, while a small proportion procured pills from another facility or clinic, so a clinic that was not a, an FPAI clinic. We asked participants to report whether or not they had received information about key aspects of the abortion process prior to starting their abortion, and overall, participants reported a lack of information about what to expect. Most notably, less than a third of participants received information about how common side effects of a medication should be managed. Only half received information about warning signs and how to identify potential complications, and 46% received information about how to prepare for the amount of bleeding to expect. But 38% of clients also said that they were not told anything about the actual amount of bleeding that they should expect. About half said they were told the bleeding would just be a bit more than a typical period, while only 9% were told that bleeding would be a lot more than a typical period. Next slide, please. 
We also asked participants questions to understand their experiences with bleeding before deciding to seek additional care. Most clients reported bleeding at some point prior to arriving to the FPAI clinic, and of those that experienced bleeding, more than half reported heavy bleeding at some point. Among those who experienced bleeding, approximately 80% of clients said that they felt weak or tired at some point due to the bleeding, and 70% said that at some point they'd felt dizzy due to bleeding. In general, bleeding lasted up to nine days before clients sought care, sorry, and about a third of participants reported bleeding for 10 or more days before arriving to the clinic. 76% of participants also reported that the amount of bleeding they experienced was more than a typical period, of which 49% said that it was a bit more than a typical period, which aligns with what they were told, but 28% said that the bleeding they experienced was a lot more than a typical period. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, only 9% were actually told that bleeding would be a lot more than a typical period. Overall, one in four participants felt the bleeding they experienced before seeking care was more than they expected. Next slide, please. We also asked participants to rate their preparedness to manage bleeding on a scale of one to five, with five being very prepared and one being not prepared at all. 85% of clients rated their preparedness to manage their bleeding as a four or a five, and only two people said that they did not feel prepared to manage their bleeding. Further, most participants felt that they could handle the amount of bleeding they experienced. However, when we asked clients about their concerns regarding their bleeding, among those who had reported bleeding at some point prior to seeking care, most participants felt somewhat or very worried about the bleeding they experienced. These results demonstrate how preparedness, expectations, and, oh, sorry, I'll <laughs> slow down more. Um, these results demonstrate how preparedness, expectations, and worries are very nuanced. People reported feeling prepared and able to handle the amount of bleeding they experienced while also expressing concerns or worries. This highlights how a single measure of concern may not be able to capture the full picture of people's experiences. These results do, however, relate to what we find when we look at the client's reasons that they reported for seeking care. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, most clients report that they sought care to confirm that their abortion was complete. And about half of clients reported they sought care due to the concerns they felt about their bleeding. When we consider warning signs of potential complications, providers in provider surveys reported observing heavy bleeding in less than 10% of the post-abortion care clients and only three clients received treatment that would indicate a severe medical complication, such as receiving IV fluids or a blood transfusion. Despite this, almost all cases were recorded as an incomplete abortion in facility-based records. This highlights the limit of recording systems because providers had to select a reason for care seeking from a pre-specified list of options which often does not include an option for just concerns about bleeding or confirmation of completion in a facility-based record system. As these findings further demonstrate, incomplete abortion is being used as a nonspecific catch-all for post-abortion care seeking and is not truly a good indicator of abortion complications. Next slide, please. So the WHO definition of an enabling environment for abortion care includes access to accurate, non-biased, and evidence-based sexual and reproductive health information. Our results demonstrate that PAC clients who were generally people who had self-managed their medication abortion lacked necessary information about what to expect for bleeding following their medication abortion. The information that they did receive often minimized their expectations of bleeding. For example, only 9% of participants were told 
their bleeding may be a lot more than a typical period, while almost 30% reported their bleeding was actually a lot more than a typical period, and a quarter felt that bleeding was more than they had expected. This potentially results in concerns about bleeding that people experienced and thus leads to care seeking. Thus, medication abortion counseling, regardless of if, oh, thank you. Uh, medication abortion counseling, regardless of, the abortion, of if the abortion is self-managed or not, should provide accurate information about what to expect throughout the abortion process and acknowledge that for some, bleeding may be a lot more than a typical period and may last as long as two weeks. The WHO definition of an enabling environment also includes access to acceptable facility-based care if someone decides they need or want it at any point. People in this study were able to access the care that they desired, but our findings underscore the need to shift how we consider and measure care seeking as it relates to method safety. Care seeking is almost always considered a sign of a complication. However, our results show that people were primarily seeking care to confirm completion, and almost no participants received treatment that would indicate a severe complication. Thus, post-abortion care seeking alone is not a sign of a complication nor an indication that abortion is unsafe. This is particularly important in the context of abortion measurement approaches that rely on post-abortion care seeking as an indicator of abortion safety. So existing methods of capturing abortion outcomes should be expanded to reflect the broader reasons for seeking post-abortion care, and providers should be aware of the critical role they play in ensuring high-quality abortion experiences for people regardless of whether the person initiated the abortion with or without clinical supervision. Next slide, please. So before I wrap up, as I also wanted to share the graphic series that we recently created with Agents of ISH based on findings from the larger study where we continued to identify information gaps around the medication abortion process and what to expect. So this digital resource that we hope people can use to get information about medication abortion and what to expect is currently available in English and Spanish. Um, I can drop the link to the full version in the chat if anyone is interested in taking a closer look and sharing with networks, but our hope was really to fill information gaps with this and provide accurate and comprehensive information based on the experiences that people reported in our study. So last slide, please. Thank you all so much, and please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Katie, um, for sharing this in-depth look into user experiences, which we know there's still a lack of data on. So I think this work's super critical. and. Um, helpful to understand perceptions of, of users and, and understand how we as a community, in particular providers, can improve those experiences when users are self-managing their abortions. So thank you. Um, last but not least, we move on to our fourth and final presentation of the session. Um, and I encourage everyone in the audience to pop your questions so far into the chat box um, and we will, it looks like have quite a lot of time for questions and answers as we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So please, please think of some questions um, that we can ask our presenters. So our <clears throat> final speakers today are, we have two speakers. We have Alice Alawo, who is with FHI 360. She's a senior technical officer. Um, and she works with FHI 360 under the SHINE project, which refers to research on the scale up of hormonal IUDs in new and emerging markets. Under the SHINE project, uh, she has supported building the capacity of community health workers to educate women in contraceptive induced menstrual changes through the normal job aid, which she'll be speaking about today. She has over 17 years of experience in both programming and research in the fields of family planning and reproductive health, also HIV AIDS prevention, care and treatment, and also maternal and newborn health. So our second speaker um, who will be co-presenting with Alice is Dr. Marzen Solomon. He's an independent consultant um, 
His background is gynecology and obstetrics with over 30 years experience in reproductive health, family planning and maternal and newborn and child health service delivery. He has experience providing overall technical oversight and leading teams of committed and highly skilled technical presenters, um, personnel, sorry, in the various um, maternal, newborn and child health and family planning technical components. He's currently working as a consultant for selected FHI 360 projects. So without further ado, I will hand over to Alice and Marston. Thank you. I will let Dr. Marston start as well. Dr. Solomon. Sorry, guys, you just bear with us. Dr. Solomon, I think you're on mute. Let me see if I can help you. Yes, you're right. Me. Sorry. I... Thank you. No so I've unmuted myself. And uh, can we have the first slide? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so am I, am I being seen? Is that OK? Or... Yes, we can okay. see you. OK, uh, yeah. So basically, um, we are going to present myself and Alice. We are presenting. Uh, the implementation and the scale up of the normal counseling tool for menstrual bleeding in Kenya. Uh, we're presenting this in this particular self care learning and discovery series. Next, please. Next, please. Um, next one, please. Next. Uh -huh. Let's have the next slide. Thank you. Um, the one before that. <laughs> Sorry, I think there might be a delay on your connection. So I'll oh, go back. A delay. I'll go back uh -huh. to the the first yes, slide. Yes. Okay. So so that's the one. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. So what are these uh, contraceptive induced menstrual changes? By definition, it's basically all changes to a user's menstrual cycle that are caused by contraception. So this will include changes in bleeding, duration, uh, changes in volume, frequency, and also including predictability. They also, it also includes, it includes changes in blood and other effluent consistency, color, and or smell. It also includes changes in uterine cramping and pain, also um, including other symptoms like um, before, during, and after menstruation. Uh, changes in experiences of um, experienced in menstrual and gynecological disorders and symptoms uh, such as endometriosis. And then also it includes short-term changes to menstrual cycle after discontinuation. Next one, please. Yeah. So fears and misconception about contraceptive induced menstrual changes contribute to discontinuation and non-use of family planning. Uh, at the same time, amenorrhea or reduced bleeding can have important non-contraceptive health and lifestyle advantages for women. Current FP counseling materials as they exist inadequately address these women concerns about bleeding changes. And uh, the normal job aid uh, tool aims to fill this gap. Uh, there is that um, link there provided to, so that one can follow and get a small review of counseling materials conducted by the FHI team showing this gap. Next, next, next uh, slide, please. So uh, there was a study that was implemented here in Kenya and um, uh, titled a field test of the normal job aid with the community health workers in Kenya to address contraceptive induced menstrual changes. It was published in Global Health Science and, and Practice. And basically, 
uh, the justification to have this study was that there was a need to develop a counseling tool for menstrual changes that was simple and more accessible to clients and community health promoters. The, the study design for this um, uh, te field testing, more, more or less, uh, was, uh, was, was, uh, was a pilot that was used was was piloting the use of the job aid with the community health promoters and following them up with um, with in-depth interviews. The study objectives were um, one to pretest a draft job aid to obtain feedback on its compre comprehensibility, acceptability, usability, and recommendations for improvement. It was also for to test a revised job aid with the community health promoters to understand how it is used, challenges in using it, and recommend recommendation on how to improve it. The study was implemented or uh, executed in the um, in two uh, sub counties um, in, um, in 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 the Rift Valley. So the first one, uh, one sub-county was namely called um, Kuresois North, that is in a county called Nakuru. And another one was a sub-county named uh, Mogotio uh, in a county called Baringo. They are all in the Rift Valley. Next, please. Next, please. So the key findings from the pilot study overall, um, according to the community health promoters, the job aid increased the effectiveness of their counseling and supported division, diffusion of information to the community. All the community health promoters liked it, and they said that they used the job aid because it gave them new information and made counseling easier. All reported, all the community health promoters reported offering the job aid to them to most clients and that most clients accepted a copy. Community promoters noted clients referred their friends and families to them after counseling using the job aid. The same community promoters say that the job aid reduced clients and their male partners' concerns about contraceptive induced menstrual changes and helped clients to select or switch family planning methods. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, thank you. So the, the key findings from the pilot studies and, uh, and self-care um, was that um, as we continue, all the community health promoters participants offered the job aid to most clients to take home and most clients did not take, did take them away. Some clients asked to take additional job aid so that they could share with friends who then go to the community health promoters to learn more. The low and non-literate clients took the job aids home so that they can ask their husbands or friends to read for them. Um, community promoters indicated that clients say that in the past, they were worried about the contraceptive induced menstrual changes, but now they are reassured that these changes are normal. A quote from the community, one of the community promoters uh, says, state this, it has helped them, that is a community promoters, it has helped them because initially they were worried but when I when when I uh, when they say the community health promoters stated that when I educated them, they were satisfied, and they continued using without any fear. So now, um, next please. Yes, I will now turn this presentation to my colleague Alice to take it from there. Alice. Thank you so much, Dr. Solomon. And over the next few slides, we will be looking at how the job aid looks. So the job aid comes when it is laminated in A4 size. Um, the, the Kenya A4 size is a normal uh, full scap. And so it's come, it comes when it is laminated, uh, the front and the back side. And so the front side uh, provides an introduction to the contraceptive induced menstrual uh, changes, the job aid itself. And the emphasis is a reminder to the community healthcare worker 
to emphasize the fact that these changes are, you know, it is common and normal to have changes in menstruation when they start to use some of the family planning methods. So that is the main message that comes at the front of the job bait. Next slide, please. In addition, we also see parts, again, the front side of the job bait. We now see the initials normal and each of them is spelled out. And these are usually the key messages that the community um, healthcare workers use to counsel their clients and you know counsel and educate their clients. So the first letter, which is normal, the community health workers um, emphasize the fact that it is normal and safe to have the changes in their monthly periods when they use some of the family planning methods. And it is also a reminder to them that, you know, they will experience different changes. It is not common for everyone to have the same changes. And then the O is um, a reminder that uh, some of the menstrual changes, such as the lighter bleeding, or when there is a pause in bleeding, will provide opportunities for the users to get strength and also to have freedom so that they can go on with their daily activities. For the app, the community health workers educate the women that um, their monthly periods and fertility will return to normal when they stop using family planning. Again, return to, first, uh, to fertility is usually one of the main concerns for contraceptive users. And so they are concerned, you know, sometimes they are, they're worried, you know, will they um, get pregnant when they stop using the contraceptive method? So that this is a reminder that indeed they will return to fertility whenever they stop using the family planning method. And then the end is a reminder for them that different family planning methods can cause different bleeding changes. Again, this is an emphasis that, you know, it really depends on what method they're using. And so the contraceptive changes are not similar across the methods. Each method has different contraceptive, has different menstrual changes that take place. And so that is the, the um, emphasis during the M. For the letter A, again, the women are, counseled and educated that when they experience absence of monthly bleeding, it does not mean that they are pregnant. Again, this is usually one of the concerns from our experiences. When the women do not um, have their periods, they worry that they could be pregnant. And so upfront, they are educated and reminded that this does not mean that they are pregnant. And then for the L, they are talked to and reminded that should they contraceptive, should the monthly changes that they're experiencing stop them from, you know, continuing with their routine activities, then they need to seek medical advice so that they can be provided with alternative treatment. So those are the six key messages that form the letter, the, the word normal when it comes to the counseling messages. Next slide, please. In addition to what we have seen, the, the letter, the word normal and the key messages that come with each letter, there's also a list of common bleeding changes for each plan, family planning method. Remember the different family planning methods come with different um, bleeding changes. And so for each and every method, for the injectable, we have uh, bleeding when they don't expect it, we have spotting, we have less bleeding and we have more bleeding and sometimes post bleeding. And then for the implants, we have bleeding when they don't expect it, the risk spotting and those others. And then for the pills, they will experience, um, and this is just the progestin only pills, they will experience shorter bleeding. They will experience bleeding when they don't expect it and longer bleeding among others. And then for the combined oral pills, they, will, they should expect shorter bleeding less bleeding or spotting. It can be any of those. It doesn't have to be all of them. It is one uh, one of those. And then for the copper ID, they may experience no change or they could have more bleeding or even longer bleeding. And for the, mon uh, for the hormonal IUD, they could experience bleeding when they don't expect it, less frequent bleeding or even post bleeding. Next, please.
one of the things that came out um, during the field testing of the normal job aid that Dr. Solomon has described was that a number of women did not understand or did not have the basic information about the menstrual cycle. And so as part of the revision and add-on, uh, through the normal job aid, there is provision of basic information about how the menstrual uh, cycle works. And it highlights the bleeding period, it highlights the time when a woman is fertile, and it, you know, it also uh, highlights the time when the you know, they're preparing to receive their monthly uh, bleeding. And so this is just a summary, or, you know, and more additional education in response to the field test that was conducted. Next, please. A lot has been done uh, within uh, the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Um, once the job aid was uh, field tested, uh, this was adopted nationally by the government. And so a number of things have been done as a result. First of all, recently, uh, Kenya developed self-care guidelines in reproductive health, and the job aid has been added to the self-care guidelines to continue with the education. Apart from that, within the Division of Reproductive and Maternal Health, now the normal job aid is included as part of the documents that are in this package. Again, Kenya is currently um, rolling out hormonal IUD as well as DM, uh, DMPA SC. And part of that orientation package includes the normal job aid that the um, community health care workers use to, you know, for educating women in the community. And it has also been included in the in, in the training materials for the community health care providers that as had been mentioned in my introduction, it is part of what is being used to build capacity of community health promoters to educate women in the community about potential menstrual changes. And so Kenya has uh, adopted the wide use of the um, normal job aid and we are happy that it is um, in use across the country. Next slide, please. And so if you, you require to, if you'd like to take a look at some of, of the job aid, uh, job aid itself, uh, please feel free to click there. And we also have um, results from the pilot. And just to mention that the job aid is in different languages. We have uh, the job aid in uh, English, we have the job aid in um, Kiswahili, and now we also have it in two uh, local languages. So it's available in four different languages in Kenya. Thank you and back to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Alice and Dr. Solomon for reminding us of the, the range of bleeding that users can experience um, with different contraceptive methods and, and also highlighting how critical it is um, and how we have an ongoing need for provision of basic information and educational tools for users and providers using the Kenyan case study. And also great news that um, Kenya has adopted self-care reproductive health guidelines. That's, that's really fantastic. So I want to thank all of our presenters today for preparing such interesting and comprehensive and informative presentations. I think this has already been said, but for those of you who haven't seen the message, the slides will be shared, and I believe a recording is being made. Yes, it is of this uh, of this um, session, so you'll be able to access it afterwards if need be, and also share it with colleagues potentially who weren't able to join today, but were registered. Um, we I also want to thank everyone for managing to speak slowly, but at the same time keeping on time. So we've wrapped up. Um, with an extra couple of minutes for questions and answers. So that's great. Um, I've seen that there's been some back and forth already in the chats. There was a few questions for Diana, um, but I will open up the floor to see if there are any other questions from anyone in the audience for any of the speakers. Um, or if you prefer to put your question in the chat, then please go ahead now. Um, so I'll wait a few minutes for that or speak up or put up your hand if you would like to ask a question.
Okay, I'm not seeing any new questions coming up. There were a couple of questions from Azioma. Are you still on the line? Um, some clarifying questions, I believe, for, for both Mina and Diana. Did you still want to um, ask those questions? I'm going to take that as a no, or that maybe he's left. Um, so in the meantime, while we wait for potentially some more questions, if anyone has them, I have a couple myself. Um, my first is to Mina. Um, I know one of the backdrops for your for this work, the work you were presenting on the reusable pad option in Bolivia has been um, the climate change situation in Bolivia and the environmental element. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering if there has been any, if there's any information around um, the environment, environmental impact of the use of disposable sanitary pads in Bolivia or more globally, that you guys are potentially measuring this work against or thinking about when you think about rolling out reusable pads in, in Bolivia? Is there like a, a target that you're thinking about or a, a metric that you're keeping in mind in terms of improving the overall environmental situation? Thank you very much for your questions. <laughs> very interesting, the climate change related to the menstruation, especially the disposal pad, the menstrual pad, right? I think that the most, uh, no, most important thing is the plastic waste and landfill impact. And also, so in Bolivia, there are a lot of, uh, in, so far, uh, in my perspective, uh, Bolivia, we, it's now it has been enough to you know, to ob obtain the landfill. However, in the near future, there can be you know if improper disposal of use of pet in the landfill can result in release of greenhouse gases such as the maintain of during the deposition, no disposition, additionally, additionally the seizure volume of disposal pad disposal in the landfill contributed to overall waste problems. And particularly in Bolivia, it, Bolivia and I decided to do these reusable sanitary pad activities because of the toilet. Because in the schools, in the public toilet, there are not enough to waste to disposal places that we can throw away our disposal pad. So, and it's not proper and it's not clean in the toilet. So it is very difficult to, to menstrual and hygiene management, management to, among the women and girls. So the, I decided to, to provide uh, this alternative method uh, to utilize the reserve sanitary pad in Bolivia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mina, for, for adding that context. I think it's super helpful um, and pertinent to keep in mind why the use of reusable pads could be um, beneficial in, in different ways. Um, I do see now we have a hand up from Martha. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, uh, quickly. Yeah, thanks all the presenters. Excellent, really clear and great presentation. So thank you to all of them. A couple of things really strike me across them. One is sort of the, you know, the power, the mystique, the mythology, the taboos around, menstrual blood or blood from the vagina of various sorts and its and its power and salience and one of the things that struck me was both um in terms of the uh the work in latin america the the concern concern around post um post abortion bleeding and that is more if i understand more around you know is this complete? Is this all done? Is this process now finished for them? And that that kind of concern versus a side effect of a hormonal IUD, which is typically either shortened bleeding or whatever. So I, I guess my meta point is, and everyone raised it, but I still find this is really still a need, is for better under women's understanding of the menstrual cycle, 
of what's normal menses, what's not, what blood, you know, all of that. We talk about it a lot, but yet every time we hear the same results, it's like women need to learn more about X. And so I'm just hoping that we can really put more emphasis on that. And just the last point about the accompaniment model, I think in Latin America and the Jews in Haiti, I think is a really, really important program model. Um, and it works across other areas, not just in you know abortion, it's worked with cervical cancer and breast cancer, et cetera. So I'm wondering if we can tap that model um, and use it for you know more education around menstruation and, and menses and bleeding just generally. So thank you all. Sort of a common question, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, thank, thanks, Martha. Um, I think I might um, pivot to um, our last two presenters. Um, so Katie, and then also our colleagues from, from FHI 360, um, in case either of them have any anything to add to that or anything to bounce off of or comment on. Sure. I'm happy to share a little bit and add on to it. I think it's a really great point about using accompaniment models and learning from colleagues in Latin America and the great work that folks are doing there. Um, a lot of our research stems from seeing that these accompaniment models work and help people have high quality abortion experiences. Um, and part of what our next steps are with the work that I mentioned in India is adapting the tool that I shared at the end of my presentation um, with more extensive and comprehensive information on the back of the graphics to help support um, ASHAs and local community health workers in India that are working with the clinics to be able to provide more comprehensive information and help them feel more comfortable answering questions um, to people who may be seeking just reassurance um, after taking medication abortion, whether that be with clinical or without clinical supervision. Um, so yeah, just a little uh, plus one to your comment as well. That's important pieces. Thank you, Katie. Dr. Solomon, I saw you. Yeah, to do I well. wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to just chime in on what Martha mentioned about uh, the 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 wide range of. Uh, um, concerns and information concerning the menstrual menstruation the menstrual cycle yeah and 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 it and therefore um, it needs therefore to to sensitize more the population uh, about it especially the, the the whole idea of um when they're using the con contraceptive um for example when they're having they're using a contraceptive and the periods of uh, I've I've, um, I've I've ceased to be there, and therefore, in medical language, they are called that they've become a menorrhea. I think that's still a problem in terms of uh, uh, you know convincing a client where you know about the reason that most likely if they're on contraceptives, then and they are amenorrheic, then maybe they have no period, then most likely they should still take it as normal. Um, but then. They would have further questions to ask, and they usually do. Okay, so the the blood is is not coming out. Um, so where is it going? Uh, is there is there a dam? A good number believe the the blood is being channeled somewhere else in the body um, to uh, maybe a dam or some some sort of a dam. You know, this is how they are perceiving the whole thing. So there's a lot of um, uh, passage of the correct information and uh, allaying their anxieties and fears. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just trying to agree with uh, what Martha's, Martha's concern is all about in terms of the men's menstruation information. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Um, we have still have a few more minutes. Um, Diana or, or Mina, do you want to add to that at all or have any other comments or anything else you would like to um, add in these final few minutes on top of your presentations? I want to add some comment that about the menstrual menstrual cycle. Yeah. In my, I didn't say in in my presentation here, but understanding menstrual cycle is very important in Latin America and even in in Bolivia specifically, especially because uh, as a, we also had a provided the questions 
do you know the menstrual cycle properly or not? So most of the participants, they don't know exactly how to calculate their menstrual cycle. So I think that we need more put effort to educate more accurate about the menstrual cycle in around the world, not only Bolivia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mina. So we have one more minute if anyone would like to ask one final question. Otherwise, I think we can move on to wrapping up this session today. Okay. So I think we can we can move on to wrapping up, um, which will only take a few minutes. Um, so again, huge thanks to our panelists today for submitting such fantastic and interesting abstracts um, that allowed for the creation of this session. Um, and also for everyone who's joined today and has showed their support and interest in the self-care learning and discovery series. Um, and a big round of applause to everyone who's been involved in, um, in the series over the last few weeks, making it happen. It's, um, I'm sure a lot of the resources will be available and accessible after this the series is over. Um, I want to remind everybody that there will be a quick survey circulated to um, participants um, and also speakers. So please, if you can spare a few minutes to answer that survey, it will help the organizers to um, improve on anything going forward. Um, and other than that, I would just like to wish you all a fantastic rest of your day, um, whether it's still to come or closing down and very much appreciate you all being here with us today. Um, thank you, everybody. And I don't know if um, my colleagues from, um, yeah, my colleagues Kim or Liz would like to say anything else. Otherwise, I will say goodbye to you all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.